Hi, everyone, and welcome to this um, event by the American Enterprise Institute on free speech in the digital age. I'm Mark Jamison. I'm a visiting scholar with AEI, and I direct two research centers at the University of Florida. Today, we're going to focus on the principles of free speech, not the legal definition, because we want to understand what free expression means and its consequences. These seem to be in flux in our digital age. We have with us three very distinguished panelists that I'll now introduce. Nadine Strassen is the John Marshall Harlan II Professor of Law Emerita at the New York Law School. She served as president of the American Civil Liberties Union from 1991 to 2008, the first woman in the history to lead the ACLU. The National Law Journal has named her one of America's 100 most influential lawyers and several other publications have named her one of the country's most influential civil liberties advocates. She's made thousands of public presentations before diverse audiences, including on more than 500 campuses and in many foreign countries. And she comments frequently on legal issues, including free speech in the national media. Pamela Pereski is a visiting senior research associate at the University of Chicago Stavanovich Institute for the Formation of Knowledge. Her current project, Habits of the Free Mind, is a toolkit for engaging across lines of difference without feeling traumatized and without dehumanizing others. It served as a centerpiece for, academic core, for an academic course at the University of Chicago in 2020, and it will eventually become a book. Her work aims to guide readers and students to develop the practices and mental habits necessary to engage in constructive dialogue and disagreement, embrace our common humanity, and thrive in a pluralist liberal democracy. David Fry is a Canadian attorney at law, turned famous YouTuber, YouTuber under the pseudonym uh, Viva Fry. That's where I came across him. Uh, David produces videos on free speech, politics, and social cultural issues, both in the US and Canada. And as, as YouTube has doubled down on his content moderation, David spends a lot of his days on the front lines of the free speech debate. As a lawyer, he's presented cases before judges in both the superior court and appellate level courts in Canada, all while becoming a rising star on the internet. David's legal expertise has equipped him well for the world of online politics, and we're excited to have him with us today. So Nadine, Pamela, and David, welcome. Thank, Thank you. you for having us. Well, let me begin with just a, a brief context. When this country, and, and David, I'm going to refer to the U.S. as this country, uh, when it was founded, there was broad consensus that government should not infringe on freedom of speech. Indeed, the First Amendment to the Constitution reads, and I quote, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press, end quote. Fast forward to the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, this right to freedom of speech comes under fire, but the courts speak, and they take the First Amendment quite literally. Let's fast forward to today. Nadine, I'm going to ask you, my sense is that college students, faculty, members of Congress, heads of social media, and a lot of other people are they say they're in favor of freedom of speech, but there seems to be an asterisk. And the asterisk says, well, here are the exceptions. And that list of exceptions just seems to be growing longer. And that worries me. But what's your assessment of the status of free speech today in our digital age? Well, thank you so much, Mark, for that uh, very helpful introduction. In terms of legal protection for free speech, as you indicated, the United States Supreme Court, starting around the 1960s, has continued to vigorously enforce robust protection against government suppression of speech, which is what the First Amendment protects us against. So famously or infamously, the Supreme Court has protected a whole range 
change a very controversial, unpopular speech, everything from hate speech, including burning crosses, uh, to animal crush videos, to um, funeral protests by the Westboro Baptist Church that are denouncing gay people and military people and Catholics and basically anybody who's not a member of the church, on and on and on. Uh, the Supreme Court basically has consistently enforced the notion that government may never suppress speech simply because its viewpoint, its idea, its message, or its content is either deeply despised or vaguely feared to be potentially dangerous. In a nutshell, the Supreme Court has said government may restrict speech only if it can satisfy the very heavy burden of showing that the restriction is absolutely necessary to prevent some specific imminent serious danger, such as intentionally inciting imminent violence that's likely to happen imminently, an example that's been touched upon a lot lately. However, to protect us against government suppression of speech is not enough to secure meaningful free speech when so many powerful private sector individuals and institutions are exercising speech suppressive power as a practical matter that is beyond constitutional constraints. Moreover, many of these powerful private sector actors, including social media platforms, uh, far from having any duties under the First Amendment to non-discriminatorily allow access to controversial speech, as government must do, to the contrary, they have their own First Amendment rights, which permit them to pick and choose in whatever fashion they want. It can be arbitrary it can even be flagrantly discriminatory. And I do believe that they should have these free speech rights with a potential caveat that we may get to later on. Uh, so the question is, what can we do to secure meaningful free speech? And, and many of us like to use the term, uh, Mark, a free speech culture as well as free speech law. And that includes a culture that would uh, persuade powerful companies, but also individuals and groups of individuals, such as social media mobs, who are also exercising their free speech rights when they call for deplatforming other speakers, but the net effect on our free speech culture and the opportunity to express ideas, even indeed, especially when they are controversial or unpopular, is very much under siege. Well, thank you. Now, panelists, she just stepped into a space where you're a real expert on what are the implications of free speech or restricted speech on how societies develop, how individuals develop. What, what are your thoughts on the state of the things today and, and what the underlying principles are? Well, first of all, thank you for having me. This is uh, such a great opportunity to talk about a very important issue. Um, I think what we're seeing now is a, um, a shift from a general sort of understanding that we had culturally that free speech was uh, a way for the disempowered to have a voice. Um, to a, a sort of misunderstanding that it's people in power um, who are benefiting from freedom of speech. Um, I think that what we've uh, sort of lost in teaching our children and certainly on college campuses is the understanding that it's only people in power who can censor. So if you want to look for who really has power, you want to look for who is looking to silence people. Um, who is asking for censorship. Um, so uh, that's one of, the, one of the areas that I think uh, our education system has done not a very good job. Um, if you ask students um, in high school in particular and, and even in college, um, they are not really very well aware of how freedom of speech and, and our, uh, our free speech culture had uh, such a, a powerful and helpful effect on our civil rights, on the civil rights movement. It, it wouldn't have been possible without freedom of speech. So, um, so the, the main thing is that people really need to start 
um, a, a new sort of movement of understanding that the disempowered are who are empowered by freedom of speech. So that's that's the first thing. The second is that all of the uh, the efforts for social media platforms uh, to to reduce disinformation and misinformation by censoring has um, potentially had the opposite effect. Uh, for one thing, people have moved off of the mainstream platforms onto the less visible or even dark web. Um, at the, nat the Network Contagion Research Institute, where I do some research, um, we've found that, for example, QAnon and other conspiracy theories have moved into the dark web, and that makes them harder to detect. Um, it makes it harder to see what they're doing. Um, but then they also are able to create less detectable memes that then spread on mainstream media platforms, encouraging people to, um, to take on these um, not credible ideas. Um, and, and that's, uh, that's a, a, a problem in our, uh, in our information system. There's a, um, an idea of uh, friction that Tobias Rose Stockwell and Renee DiResta spoke about in, a, in an article in Wired, which I think is a very smart way of thinking about this issue that um, there's a tension between speed and accuracy and, and false news on social media that makes its way uh, faster and more widely uh, through our system than, um, than accurate news does. So uh, friction is the idea that you need to slow down, there needs to be stop gaps, there needs to be um, obstacles to getting things uh, out in that, uh, in that way. I don't know how we create those, but I think we need to create them culturally rather than creating them um, from a, 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 a regulatory uh, sort of system. Okay, well, thank you. David, you, you come at this, or you bring to this conversation, something that's different, that you, one, you're from Canada, so the, the legal dimensions are a little bit different, um, but also your business is speech, and a <laughs> lack of freedom of speech um, really messes with, with commerce in some instances. So tell us what your thoughts are, where we are, and, and how it's going. So first of all, thank you for having me, because I never would have thought I'd be here a year and a half to two years ago, this is an accidental journey. Um, I started making these, you know, YouTube videos breaking down legal stuff, never thinking I would get into the culture wars or you know the war on freedom of speech, and I never really fully appreciated the difference, the fundamental difference between freedom of speech in the United States and Canada. You know, in the hate speech is not a concept that's that's tolerated in in the United States as far as restrictions on freedom of speech go. You know, you have the the criteria of the true threat being the one reasonable limit. Whereas in Canada, we have hate speech laws. We have, um, we have human rights tribunals giving fines to stand-up comedians for making jokes about a handicapped uh, celebrity kid. Uh, true case. Uh, so now I fully appreciate where things go once you start going off that slippery slope. Um, and you know, the issue is, People say, well, okay, it's freedom of speech. Congress shall enact no laws. So, so long as private enterprise does it, I don't have a problem with it. It's not illegal. And, you know, if it stops me from hearing things I don't like, I like that today, not appreciating what that might mean for them tomorrow. And you have private enterprise, which are effective monopolies that control the public square, uh, exercising uh, what would otherwise be unlawful conduct for the government without themselves being subjected to the checks and balances that would otherwise be imposed on government, which makes it even more dangerous. And, you know, speaking to the, 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 the friction issue and the reverse effect that all this has, and people appreciate it only in retrospect, when you have social media giants, the monopolies, censoring information, and people subsequently find out that that information, which was censored two months ago, is in fact accurate information, it causes them to be more suspicious of other more sinister stuff that might have been censored that might in fact be misinformation. And so you have this Streisand effect on social media, which is to the effect that by censoring something, you bring more attention to it and you invariably lend more credibility to it by so censoring it. Um, and so the, it does have this reverse effect uh, on, on, on substantive matters that might be actual misinformation. But when you censor, for example, the Hunter Biden story 
only to a couple of weeks later admit that, yeah, it was, it was a true story. We shouldn't have done what we did. Well, then when you have them censoring other more potentially serious issues, you have people reflexively going into the mode of, is this real censorship or is this politically motivated censorship? And it causes, I've seen now in a year and two years, it causes more harm than good. All right, well, thank you. Um, Nadine. Thank you. I just, um, in my initial remarks, I said I wanted to mention one caveat to my generalization that social media censorship is protected by the First Amendment. And one caveat is this. If the social media companies are in fact engaging in their speech restrictions, including on so-called hate speech, I agree with you, David, it is an inherently uh, subjective, vague concept. The same is true for disinformation or misinformation, which is why these concepts are so dangerous. They're basically enforced according to the predilections of those who wield power or those they are responsive to. And it, we have real basis for feeling hearing that the social media companies are in fact acting at Congress's uh, and other government officials' uh, demands. And, and the demands initially were quite veiled, but they are getting more and more explicit. Just last week, the heads of Facebook, Google, and Twitter were hauled before Congress for uh, the third time in less than five months. And, and members of Congress on both sides of the aisle, by the way, are basically saying, you better restrict more of what we consider to be dangerous speech. Uh, if not, we're going to do it for you or we're going to do it to you. And uh, sensibly, the constitutional law doctrine that says generally private sector actors are not held to a constitutional standards has a common sense exception, which is when they are so entangled with the government, when basically the government is pressuring or inducing them to engage in conduct that would be illegal if the government did it itself directly, it should be equally illegal when it's done through government coercion. And I think we're getting closer and closer to that point if we're not already at it. And if I can add, you yeah. know, the the um, the First Amendment limits on um, on speech are a really wise set of principles to use for other entities as a as a limit, um, with time, place, and manner restrictions, as Nadine can can attest that there are restrictions within the First Amendment about when people and where people and in what way people can um, exercise their First Amendment rights. For example, in a classroom, we can't allow students to say anything and everything they want in whatever way they want in order for us to be able to teach. So, you know, as, as much as students like to think that they have freedom of speech in the classroom, they don't have unrestricted freedom of speech in a classroom. Um, and in a business, you can't have people protesting or uh, you know, doing things that disrupt business inside your company. So there are uh, there are some restrictions that employers can can place on their employees that that professors can and administrations can place on their on their students, um, and those are actually really um, well suited for being used as a, a sort of guideline, like a mental map for what ways people should think about how they exercise their freedom of speech. And what David was saying is really important that the more these social media platforms engage in censorship and the more the, the government and, and what Nadine was talking about is especially important, the more that people see that the government and the, that these platforms are operating in tandem the less people trust the social media platforms and the less they trust what the social media platforms are saying is not credible information. And the more they search for and find less credible information. So it has a, a, a deleterious effect. It, it, um, go sorry. ahead, David, then maybe I'm gonna come, or sorry, Pamela, I'm gonna come back to you because you started out with the word wise and you talked about you know why these principles should matter broadly. I, I want you to tease that apart some more. But David, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say on, on the issue of, you know, the social media giants effectively acting as agents to the government. We're seeing it now. Uh, and, and so then the question is, 
to the extent that they're acting as agents to the government, should they not be held to the same standard? And if they're not, and they're actually exercising, we, we call it now getting into the Section 230 issue, we call it editorializing their, 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 their content on their platform, should they not then be held to you know, some other lawful standards that would otherwise apply to other people who were making such editorial decisions as to what they're going to publish, what they're going to remove, who they're going to brand as misinformation and who they're not. The, and the amazing thing is you have the corruption that you can have when the social media giants are acting as agents to the government. But when it becomes a business of itself, you have the corruption there as well. Candace Owens is suing Facebook now uh, on the basis, you know, defamation and other issues. But there becomes a business and it becomes profitable for Facebook to qualify certain things as misinformation and redirect to their trusted partners who are, in fact, you know, partners in, a, in an economic sense as well. And so people are not stupid. And the Internet has democratized information to some extent. It's democratized misinformation to some extent as well. But when people start finding out the corrupt nature, uh, you know, the incestuous relationship with government or the economically corrupt nature of what social media is purporting to be good faith, fact checking, good faith uh, censorship, it, it really causes a massive distrust uh, and it causes people to lend more legitimacy and cre uh, credibility to what would otherwise be things that people might write off as conspiracy and do their own research and find out more on. So just wanted to add that. Okay, very good. So I want to spend more time on that trust issue because that seems that's very important for social fabric. But let me get back to why free speech matters. Um, it could be that we just don't trust politicians and that's what the First Amendment was all about, but I, I suspect there's more to it. And, and Pamela, I think you alluded to it. Could you talk about why freedom of expression is important for the, the social development, personal ideas? Because I, I know you've done some work and you have colleagues that have done work in that area. Yeah, and so uh, I, I, thankfully, I was able to teach at the University of Chicago, which is peerless in its protection of, of student expression rights and faculty expression rights and academic freedom. Um, and uh, I, I think what we sometimes fail to remember um, is that freedom of speech is a principle, it's a philosophy, and as Nadine said, a, a culture in which people have to sort of, friction I think is a, another, a, it's a good way to think about it in this realm too, is that we have to have some friction we can't have, uh, we can't surround ourselves with people who only say the things that we like. We have to be able to grapple with ideas and people and words that we find upsetting, that we find offensive in order to challenge ourselves, to challenge our ideas, in order to sharpen our arguments. Um, in, in Judaism, there's a, a, um, a concept called machlochet l'shem shemayim, which means argument for the sake of heaven. The idea is that your interlocutor who opposes you is your partner in your search for truth. And this is a noble endeavor. And it's not just good for you, it's also good for society. So you have to have the, the hardiness, the persistence, the resilience to be able to grapple with ideas that you find fundamentally abhorrent. Hence, the ACLU being able to uh, defend neo-Nazis marching in Skokie, because at the time they understood the, the, the necessity of a free speech culture in which even that, that very upsetting, very um, emotionally injurious um, event was necessary for our, our society to thrive. And people were able to deal with that. We have to have the ability to confront even the most horrifying ideas in order to def defend our ideas, in order to overturn bad ones, in order to convince people, persuade people of the rightness of our ideas or change our minds. It, it all has to be um, possible. The more people are, are um, uh, isolate, isolated and surrounded by people who agree with them, people who um, only say things that don't upset us, the less we're capable of thriving in a pluralist liberal democracy and the more authoritarian people that the society becomes. All right. Thank you, Pamela. So I'm going to turn to you, Nadine, because 
you know, Pamela was telling us about these, this, this conflict of ideas is necessary for our, our mental resilience, our social resilience. Um, you have, you know, you have a comment on that, but also I want you to talk about a, a book you've written, which if I'd been clever, I'd have it beside me, but I don't, it's on my desk over there, um, about the way to battle hate speech is with free speech. And so tell us, tell us about this, if you would, please. Uh, yes, and thank you for You're calling. Clever. I'm not, okay. In which, which I quote Pamela multiple times because uh, for a different but really important point, a lot of the censorship that's going on of hate speech, including on college campuses, is allegedly to protect victims of, uh, or intended victims, I should say, of disparaging racist and other hate, hateful slurs to protect their mental and psychological and emotional well-being, right? We hear students regularly complaining about the trauma uh, that these words cause them. And Pamela is uh, herself an expert, and she quotes other experts in psychology and mental health who say, you know, it may be well intended to uh, protect these students from hearing hurtful, offensive, insulting words, but actually it does them more harm than good in terms of their psychic well-being, their emotional health. I mean, we've got to prepare them for the real world where they're going to be subject to not only hateful, hurtful expression, but also actions. And so so I think that's another really important point. I, I wanted to add, Mark, to Pamela's great um, explanation of some of the many um, virtues of free speech that in our democratic republic, and this is as true for our friends in Canada as in the United States, that freedom of expression is important not only as a matter of individual and social well-being, as Pamela explained, but the United States Supreme Court it said it so well when it comes to speech about public officials or candidates or public affairs, it is more than a matter of individual liberty. It is a matter of self government. It is these freedom of speech is essential to self government. We, the people, to quote the opening words in our constitution, wield sovereign power. How can we effectively do that unless we have the most robust, unfettered freedom to hear from uh, those who are seeking to be our leaders or who are wielding political power and the most robust freedom to criticize them, dissent from them, question them, which is why I'm very concerned about uh, the social media platforms ousting democratically elected officials, right? Donald Trump was still president of the United States, commander in chief of the, uh, of the armed forces in this country, finger on the nuclear trigger, he had a lot of power. And when Facebook deplatformed him, what was at issue was not only his right to convey his ideas, and you know, I'm not defending the content of his ideas any more than I defended the content of the Nazi ideas. It's the principle that's at stake. But freedom of speech also means the right of willing audience members to hear the ideas and information. How can Trump's critics effectively respond to him if they can't hear what he's saying? And, and incidentally, a number of political analysts believe that it was precisely his controversial tweets and, and other social media posts leading up to the election um, that his most incendiary controversial posts that helped to tilt the election against him. People, you know, his, his opponents were, were galvanized by that. So there's not a simple cause and effect between hearing ideas you may disagree with and therefore, oh, it will do good to censor them. And another way in which that could be counterproductive. All right. I've got, I've got to say something actually, an, an amazing point is how, how can they respond to him if he's not on the platform? You know, this is a, a feature, not a bug. Uh, you know, when they, when they ran the tests of whether or not they could unperson someone with Alex Jones and they got away with it, uh, they saw what you can do is you get a person off a platform so they can no longer defend themselves. So nobody can actually hear the actual words spoken by the person so that they can then get away with saying whatever they want. And no one can check the veracity of what they're saying or hear the opposite side. Um, you know, I, I, my, my understanding or my feeling now, a lot of young people 
uh, especially in university settings, uh, tolerate the censorship because they're under the impression, you know, like, wh why do I need to hear? Wh why do people need to say things I don't like without appreciating that the freedom of speech is preci precisely the idea of having the freedom to say things that you don't like? Because otherwise, it's not freedom of speech. It's already censored speech. And, you know, youth has its benefits, but it also has its uh, pitfalls, one of which is lack of experience. And when you don't yet understand and have not yet seen how it gets weaponized and politicized. And for, you know, a prime example is you don't want hate speech on social media platforms. Facebook doesn't want racist posts. And so then when you try to share politically uh, oriented posts of, say, prime ministers or other leaders who were dressed up in offensive costumes a little while back, and then those start getting censored on the basis of hate speech. Well, now you actually have censorship, politically motivated censorship that is disguised as hate speech. And I think a lot of people, once they realize that, they will realize the true value of uncensored freedom of speech, even if you find it utterly offensive, because it, it goes from the objective to the subjective to the politically motivated. And that is how you go from a free society to a tyrannical one. And also there's a, mis there's a level of misinformation about free speech in the US, where I think a lot of students have the idea, and I think some of the surveys bear this out, uh, have the idea that our laws are more like Canada's laws, such mm -hmm. that they'll say things like, uh, free speech, but not hate speech. And that's a, that's a basic misunderstanding of what our free speech laws protect, which is hate speech. And I think there's a counter, there's a, a corresponding misunderstanding, which is that hate speech or all speech is absolutely protected in the United States. Right. That's not true. I think our law does draw very sensible distinctions between protected speech and unprotected speech, which is it's never unprotected solely because of con content that is unpopular or controversial only when in a particular context, it directly poses an emergency, you know, specific imminent harm that can only be averted via censorship. So if, if hateful speech, you know, is said in a way that uh, intends to instill a reasonable fear that you're gonna be subject to violence, that's a punishable true threat or if hateful speech is said in the context of intentional incitement of imminent violence, which is likely to happen, that can be punished. So I think, you know, there's a misunderstanding. I, I, I totally agree with Pamela. The more people would understand about what our law actually does, the more supportive they would be of it. Uh, but, you know, if I can throw into the hopper, we've talked about uh, various threats to free speech, but one that has not been expressly mentioned that I know we're all concerned about is self-censorship. And, you know, survey after survey continues to show that substantial majorities of people in this country, I assume it's the same in Canada, but I can't say I've seen any studies about Canada, uh, but in the United States, it doesn't matter whether you're talking about Republican, Democrat, conservative, liberal, young people, old people, all of us are saying that there are certain subjects that we will not address for fear of bringing down uh, at at worst stigma at best stigmatization at worst getting fired from our jobs or having some you know getting thrown out of a university which are realistic fears as we know and and those sensitive subjects are of course the the most important ones race and and, and gender and so forth Right, so I failed at the very start to tell the audience that at about uh, 1045, it will open it to, to questions and uh, you've received instructions on how to, to send those in. Um, so just to alert you to that. Uh, we've, we've talked about you know, the way members of Congress are acting, the heads of social media are acting, et cetera. Um, let me just put you in the position of one of the heads of, of social media. You've just gone through Congress saying, you will tighten down on what other people say, or I'm going to do these kinds of things to you. Um, you know from watching other platforms that you know things can get out of hand and can destroy your business model. One of the reasons that Facebook became as prominent as it is is because one of its rivals, um, I don't remember exactly what the, the uh, issue was, but it was in Brazil, it just became polluted with things that people couldn't stand. And so everybody dropped off, went someplace else. So if you're a head of social media, 
what what do you do? Uh, because you hear the importance of free speech, but you understand the challenge to your your business. David, you're the closest to something like that. So what what are your thoughts? Well, I mean, I would say that to the greatest extent possible, you have the least restrictions possible. But uh, I, I think actually the bigger issue is not the restrictions that are in place. It's just the selective application of those restrictions. I think if you had clear policy in place that was applied equally and without discrimination and without uh, uh, political discrimination, there would be very little problem. People would accept it as rules of the game. But when you have on Twitter and Facebook, for example, um, sanctions that, are, that appear to be politically motivated and there's no other explanation for it, you know, one side gets away with what are objective threats and the other one gets deplatformed for what were, you know, arguably threats. Uh, it, it is the political weaponizing of these terms of service that become the issue, not necessarily the terms of service themselves. So I, I would ensure that I have the least invasive restrictions possible to remain a, a, a free speech platform. And I would ensure that they're uh, applied without political distinction, which really does not seem to be the case and might be a, a, a dream uh, type uh, wish because it seems that these social media platforms are politically motivated at their core. All right. Um, Baydeen, what are your thoughts? If, if you sat, if you were one of the people testifying to Congress last week, what, what would be your approach? I would, well, I can't put myself in their seat, but I think what I'm advocating should be um, uh, conducive to the, their business, legitimate business concern, which is providing what the users want. And that completely coincides with my goal as a civil libertarian, which is to maximize individual user freedom of choice. And how do you do that? You don't do that through some top-down, centralized gatekeeping, one system fits all. Um, instead, you would facilitate interop what the techies call interoperability and delegability. You would open up your platforms with sufficient privacy protections, I'm assured this can be done, uh, to others to install various filtering options. And you, as a user, could delegate it. You could say, for example, I don't want to see graphic violence, or I don't want to see uh, nudity except in art. I don't want to hear anti-Semitic speech. It, or you could say, you know, I, I want to hear everything. And there could be, a, you know, just an infinite range in between. We could, the way we make our own choices about what library books we want to read, right? Um, and this is um, somewhat analogous to what was done, I understand, and you're the expert here, Mark, with landline telephone companies when they were broken up in the United States, that they, they were made accessible to other companies to build upon their basic infrastructure to facilitate a, a range of user options. Okay. So, Pamela, I'm going to get back to this issue of, of trust. You raised it earlier. David did as, as well. Um, it seems that, on the one hand, the, the social media companies have to worry about trust in their platforms. But there's also the issue of, of us trusting each other and trusting our, our politicians as well. How do you weave all that together? <laughs> <laughs> That's a very small question. Um, uh, you know, I think the only thing that I um, can focus on is what individuals can do. I'm not a policy person. I'm a psychologist. So um, I think the, the first thing that individuals can do is do a little better job of verifying the things that they're circulating. Um, for one thing, you know, I don't know if you have this experience, but I get emails from people all the time with, you know, so-and-so, this is so-and-so's, you know, keynote speech or so-and-so said something, or there's a story about this thing that happened, or did you know about these data? And it doesn't seem right. And so I look it up and it turns out that this is just false information that's been circulating. And, and most people, I don't think, look at that and then check it out before forwarding it. If, it, if it's consistent with their ideas, if it, if it um, forwards their belief, if it, if it 
seems like it would be persuasive to other people to get them to believe what they do, they just go ahead and forward it. Um, that's the kind of friction that, that Tobias Rose Stockwell um, and Renee DeResta are talking about on an individual level to create this barrier between the smooth and frictionless dissemination of disinformation. We each have a responsibility as members of a society to be trustworthy in addition to having our, uh, our institutions be trustworthy. We need to be trustworthy partners in our society. So we should do a better job individually of checking things out before we spread that misinformation unknowingly ourselves. And Twitter has done something, I don't know if Facebook has done this, but they've done something to try to help us do that, which is now, if you notice, if you want to forward um, a, um, a tweet that has an article in it, it will ask you, do you want to read the article first? <laughs> so that's, I think, a useful thing. It's annoying, right? It's, it's quite annoying, but then you get used to it. And I think it's useful because it makes you stop, uh, makes you stop. And I remember there was a, a young woman who, who um, like a very young, maybe teenager, who created an app or a, or a plugin or something that would ask you, do you really want to post this? It might offend somebody. And just that momentary pause had a, a, a significant effect on whether people would then go ahead and, and post that thing that might have been not a very nice thing to post. So those are the kinds of things that we're not really set up. Our brains are not used to this kind of very fast paced, um, instantaneous kind of communication that goes viral to you know, thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of people. So we need to really start acting in a way that's different on social media than we do in person. In person, we can say something and then uh, someone else will say, that doesn't sound right to me, are you sure? And then you can say, oh, well, I really haven't checked that out. And it's gone, it doesn't, it doesn't have persistence. But if you tweet something or post something on Facebook, it, it has a life of its own. And that misinformation, we are all part of disseminating. Well, you know, the funny thing is, I, I, I'm, I like that notification better than the one Twitter was giving, for example, with the Hunter Biden story, where it was not allowing you to physically share the link as a tweet or even oh. as a DM, which I found okay. shocking and scaring. But yeah, people should verify their own information, do a little bit of homework. People have gotten lazy. I don't think we're going to change uh, the intellectual laziness of you know, a substantial portion of the population. I think what you do do is allow the discussion to happen. And here I was hesitant to even give the example because I feel I'm, I, you know, I still think I'm on YouTube where you can't talk about the vaccine issues without getting into trouble. But one of the misinformation elements going around was, you know, the vaccine creates a, an antenna in your body for 5G. And, you know, YouTube censors that. And I say like, you know, that idea might get some traction, it might get some views, but the discussion is going to uh, elicit is going to get to the truth at the end of the day. And, you know, viral information goes viral, it gets its clicks, but the internet and the aggregate knowledge of the internet has a way of calling out the misinformation and branding the, those who provide it as misinformation that the marketplace of ideas eventually decides whose ideas are ultimately good and whose are to be discredited, even if you have a post go viral every now and again. I think the discussion is itself more viral, but just slower growing and longer lasting than the initial whatever misinformation might be of the day. But the discussion has to be allowed to happen. And yeah, if I can, it, oh, go ahead, Nadine. Even if people are too lazy or too pressed for time, which is often my, my reason for, to not check something out, at least we have to imbue them with a healthy skepticism. I understand if you have deep distrust, that can become a problem. But I think a certain amount of skepticism about everything we read from every source, dare I say, even the most respected and widely read newspapers and television sources, we should all know that we have to take it with a, a grain of salt. And in fairness, the internet does make it unprecedentedly easy and fast to do your own fact checking, right? You can go to alternative sources, you can usually go to the original source uh, quite easily. So as long as we drill it into people's heads that just because even even if a good friend like Pamela sends it to 
you, if she hasn't checked it, you know, maybe you shouldn't rely on it. On yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And and um, if I can just note that the Network Contagion Research Institute's most recent report is called A Contagion of Institutional Distrust. And it is about what happens when, uh, when people don't trust our institutions and don't trust the media. And that is part of what's happening with these, with the vaccine conspiracies and and the uh, protests against vaccines and against um, COVID restrictions, et cetera, that, that there's a one-sided narrative that's being, um, that's being disseminated by institutions. And that, that creates a pendulum that has swung very far to the other side for a group of people who just don't have any trust less. You look, look at what happened with the, that group of kids, um, I can't remember, a couple of years ago from Covington Catholic Academy or whatever it was called. And then the mainstream media jumped on a narrative that was absolutely inaccurate. Um, and it resulted in lawsuits. It resulted in, in settlements for this young man who who was just completely unnecessarily defamed. Um, and that it's, it's great to see that we have those corrective measures such that it, it was possible for him to, in that case, sue and settle, um, which is, you know, it's very difficult as Nadine can say to, to uh, win a defamation lawsuit against a news organization. Um, but, uh, but we do have those those guardrails in place. We should not have to use them that often. Yeah. And that, I, that is a problem. I gotta tell you, you may or may not be aware of this because I was in the Sandman you know, lawsuits, analyzing them at the time and talking about how censorship gets weaponized for political purposes. In the context of that discussion, YouTube uh, amended its terms of service to add, it was either a veteran heritage, uh, an, an Aboriginal heritage or veteran a service as a, 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 an element that you could not disparage of a person because one of the issues in that case was Nathan Phillips, the native elder, was actually not an elder and did not serve in Vietnam. And so people calling that out uh, were, you know, at, at the beginning doing it successfully, but then YouTube amended its services to create a guideline that made it uh, demonetizable or removable to address that issue on the basis of hate speech. And this is when you, you basically destroy the system. You destroy any trust in mainstream media, in social media platforms uh, by weaponizing the censorship under the guise of the good. It was, it was an amazing example with that case. All right. So thank you. Uh, we're going to go now go to the, the audience. I have at least one question. And if anybody has any others they want to submit, please do so. Uh, the question I have is not directed at anyone in particular. So uh, I'll take volunteers to answer it. It says, Senator Elizabeth Warren tweeted at Amazon last week that she wanted to fight to break up big tech so you're not powerful enough to heckle senators with snotty tweets, end quote. Many of her followers cheered while free speech fans cringed. This is a step back for free speech culture, but does it also suggest that there are legal defenses against antitrust actions based on free speech principles? And let me turn to one of our lawyers uh, first on that. Nadine, would you talk about that? I'm not an antitrust expert, but yeah, I'm thinking of a wonderful organization in Washington, D.C. I believe it was founded by, certainly headed by my longtime ACLU colleague, Bert Four. I can't remember the exact name, but it's something, something like the Antitrust and Free Speech Institute. And its whole uh, focus is on um, using the principles of antitrust law and free speech law in a complementary way to protect the economic marketplace as well as the marketplace of ideas. And I think when you are talking about uh, an undue concentration of economic power on the part of those who are engaged in the communications business, it necessarily is going to have a deleterious impact on free speech, right? Because uh, their policies have such an overweening 
impact. So I certainly, you know, I don't support the, the rhetoric behind that tweet at all, because I think that uh, media and, 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 and as well as individuals uh, should have free speech rights, including to criticize politicians, including to criticize politicians unfairly, just as I defend politicians' right to unfairly criticize the media entities, right? Uh, but I certainly do think that uh, the antitrust investigations that are going on now should certainly be pursued to make sure that there is not uh, an abuse of economic power. But I will say this, uh, my mind is open about that. It's a very complex set of issues defining what the relevant markets are and, and what the market power is, but it definitely something worth pursuing, but we should ha not uh, have our conclusion before we do the analysis. I, I've got to. I've got to add something here. Sorry. Go ahead. I, I've got to. I've got to add something because the hypocrisy in this tweet is <laughs> mind blowing. This is a, a, Elizabeth Warren, who is a senator who posted one of the defamatory tweets about Nicholas Sandman, who is as a senator hiding behind sovereign immunity to shield herself from liability for that defamation. Now saying that the senators should have protection from snotty tweets from the general public to criticize them. This is exactly how censorship gets weaponized to, Im to, to empower the political class to the detriment of the lowly hoi polloi who lose their ability to criticize while the senators literally have the liberty to defame. Uh, and her case is going to the Supreme Court being represented by Robert Barnes, who's challenging this. But L Elizabeth Warren literally invoked sovereign immunity to defend against her defamatory tweet against Nicholas Salmon, which she refuses to delete from the internet, and it's still there. Uh, all the while saying that senators need protection from snotty tweets. That's, what's, that's what freedom of speech is about, and that's what censorship would be about. That is putting the carriage in front of the horse, literally and ideologically. That's such a great point, David. And James Madison made the same point a couple centuries ago when he said, uh, in the United States, and let's say in Canada too, the sensorial power is in the people over the government, not in the government over the people. All right, let's go to our, our next question. It asks, um, can the panelists address the cases for copyright infringement lawsuits and DMCA take down requests that are used to censor important stories? Uh, the Bolivian government uses this approach to silence critics and political opponents. The Church of Scientology has used their copyright on their teachings to sue critics who quote them, etc. What happens when copyright law collides with the First Amendment? And I, I don't have a sense of which of you would be the most likely to, uh, to answer that. So I, I have seen the way copyright claims have been weaponized on YouTube, um, and there's some uh, less and more legitimate ways. This was one of the concerns about the EUCD implementing their new copyright policy for, for the European Union. And I said it at the time, like one of the risks is that copyright, someone's going to acquire the copyright to a politically damaging video and then make claims to take it down from the internet. And that is what happens when you no longer respect the exceptions that we have in the United States and Canada, uh, fair, fair use exceptions. It's the risk. And it's a real risk because even if it's an abusive copyright claim, as it happens on YouTube, you get, you get three of them, you have your channel taken down. And if it's for music in the background, if it's for reciting the words of a song, et cetera, it can be easily weaponized as it is. And it's one of the major dangers. And it's what happens when the exceptions or the fair use exceptions are no longer respected, which is why you have to make sure that they are not only respected in the court of law, but respected on the social media platforms because avail availing yourselves of those rights is costly and expensive. So if they're not imposed or enforced at the lowest levels, uh, good luck trying to have the courts uh, address them because it's, nobody's gonna do it. All right. Okay, one more question from the audience. So I'm very interested in the effect of censorship slash suppression, uh, public discussion of scientific issues and on the practice of science itself, on COVID-19, climate change, et cetera. Does not science require openness? To me, the competition of ideas seems crucial to science. Um, Pamela, you're a scientist. What are your thoughts on this? I think that's absolutely right. Yeah, I mean, um, there are questions about, um, you know, what kind of platform 
some, you know, like flat earth, you know, con arguments need to have or, or, um, or creationist ideas, you know, do we need to have those represented in academia in order to defend against them? There are legitimate questions about whether you want to bring that into a classroom or ignore them. Um, but um, when we look at, for example, what happened at the beginning of the pandemic, where the very little was known, the first set of information that people got was don't wear a mask. Um, and then that got revised. It, it was initially perhaps not entirely honest. Um, and that was a problem that if, if it was the case that we were all told not to wear masks because the, the uh, hospital workers, healthcare workers needed them and we were being told not to wear them because they weren't effective, that's a problem. And people needed to be able to discuss that. If the social media rules had been in place at the time that, that are in place now, where anything that, um, and I can't remember which platforms put this, in. David probably knows this, but the, yeah. the, the rules about you, you are not allowed to, uh, on social media, post information about COVID that does not conform to what the World Health Organization has put out, then people who in the beginning had been saying, no, we should wear masks, would not have been able to do that. Um, and then there are questions about medications that that were politically inconvenient to say that they were um, effective, but they seem to be effective. And other things, uh, you know, other information that doesn't conform to the narrative. And then, of course, having protests that are, you know, thousands of people after public health officials had said that we should not be gathering even outside in such large numbers. And in fact, in New York, uh, it, religious organizations were being told that, that people, the police would be involved if they had um, gatherings outside. But all of that went away for the politically appropriate um, po protests that, that the public health officials were in favor of. So that's the sort of thing that not only is it important for science, but it's also important for institutional trust. That, that we get information that's accurate, that we're able to disagree, that we're able to um, articulate our disagreement with something that we either think is disinformation or that somebody else gets to push back on us if what we're saying is not accurate. Um, anyway, David, I know you have uh, a lot more information about these. No, oh, it's, it's the absurdity is that at the beginning, uh, videos would get systematically demonetized if you even said the word coronavirus in them. And so the joke became on my channel, I refer to it as the My Sharona Cyrus, but, and it's tongue in cheek. It's just that you, you couldn't, if you mentioned the word, you would get flagged by the bot and then you'd have to, you know, all sorts of problems. But yes, you know, I say this with respect, with respect as in like, I respect religion. And I'm not saying this to denigrate religion and there's no, but um, the difference between science and religion is that you can question science, whereas you can question religion, but some parts you can't. The problem is that they're fundamentally different. They're fundamentally different, um, and when people start to treat science as a religion and not as the constantly evolving, constantly challenging uh, system that it's intended to be, uh, you know, people will regard it as religion for good and for bad. Uh, and the issue is, dogma today can be contradicted tomorrow, and you cannot have. It's no longer science when you can't challenge the ideas that are being promoted. And I would add people... that, that, that in academia, there's a difference between education and indoctrination. And what you're pointing to is that difference, that when you are educating, people are able to have arguments, they're able to disagree, they're able to push back, they're able to um, oppose and dissent. And that is not possible when you're indoctrinating. That is how I think you see the difference, the difference between education and indoctrination. Okay, so um, there's some, still some questions from the audience. We only have two minutes. And so my apologies to the people who've asked questions. Uh, we're just not going to get to them all. Uh, to wrap up, what I would like is for each of you to give two pieces of advice. 
One is what can or should not be done in law to address these issues. And then what should be done just to the private you know, citizen acting, maybe in education, maybe in their diet, their discourse or whatever that might be. Um, and David, I'll start with you. Then I'll go Pamela and Nadine will give you the last word. So I just finished listening to a book by Gad Saad. He's a professor in Montreal at Concordia. He wrote The Parasitic Mind and refers to ideas as pathogens, as viruses to some extent. And the only way you build up an immunity to viruses and is, is to expose yourself to, to dirt to some extent. You know, shielding yourself in a bubble is going to weaken your physical immune system. Shielding yourself in an ideological bubble is going to weaken your ideological system, your ideological immune system. Expose yourself to the ideas. Do not reflexively label anybody uh, as a fundamental one thing or another based on the ideas they espouse. Discuss the ideas without discussing the people and everyone will evolve. But this takes training and it takes a bit of uh, psychological callous to do because in as much as we, we challenge other people, other people are going to challenge us and it's going to make us question our beliefs. That's the practical advice. Uh, the legal advice, uh, you know, whatever you do, whatever protest you do, do it legally and do it respectfully because nothing good comes of uh, unlawful protest. That is exactly what the powers that be would want so that they can impose more restrictions. Okay, Pamela, your advice. Uh, so I would say uh, following on to what, what David just said, which I agree with entirely, um, th there's a concept uh, C.S. Lewis had of having a second friend. Um, he said that, you know, uh, your first friend, you're like your closest friend, typically agrees with you and you know you speak the same language your second friend is someone who speaks the same language but pronounces it wrong um, that this is somebody who opposes you this is somebody who you don't agree with someone who is going to push back on you find a second friend is my advice um, and and um, as far as I don't have legal advice, but I but I could say something about uh, about administrations on college campuses, college administrations have to be the absolute stalwart protectors of academic freedom and freedom of speech. And we are losing that battle. Um, organizations like Heterodox Academy, um, FIRE in particular, um, and there's a free speech union now to protect uh, professors and others who are attacked. So these are organizations that that we all need to support um, and we all need to be our own defenders of freedom of speech on campus and off. All right, thank you. Aideen, final word. Great suggestions. Uh, in terms of legal re uh, regulation that I would support, I would cite to the so-called Santa Clara principles, which were adopted by the Electronic Frontier Foundation and a range of uh, civil society organizations and others a few years ago uh, that focus on procedural issues. So I, they are not calling for direct government regulation of the social media content moderation policies, but rather procedural protections of notice and transparency and accountability. Because when we have that information, right, sunlight is the best disinfectant. And when spotlights have been shown on what these companies' practices are, they change those practices. But we, the people, have to be the ones that are bring, bringing pressure, not only the uh, powerful members of Congress with their self-interest, in terms of what individuals can do, I had also um, put down a list of organizations, including some that Pamela mentioned. I would add the Electronic Frontier Foundation, which is great on digital rights uh, issues. And, and, and then to speak up, please, and when somebody is being attacked uh, for exercising freedom of speech, you know, it makes the biggest difference to show some support and some solidarity. Uh, surveys show that it's the it, it's only the extremes of both ends of the political spectrum that are in favor of censorship and 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 against uh, discourse and and robust debate. But the vast middle is simply not being outspoken enough. So please have the courage of your convictions. It will make it easier for other people to do so. And, and hopefully the, the silent majority will no longer exercise its right to remain silent. It will exercise the opposite, the right not to remain silent. 
All right. Well, very good. So thank you all very much for all your contributions. So I've run this a little bit over my apologies, but I could go on for a long time. Uh, this has just been been great. And thank you for the audience. And thank you for all the, the people at AEI that, that work so hard to put all this together. We're all very appreciative. So thank you again. And we'll see you, hopefully see you again soon.